insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, Episode 8, Voter Suppression. Uh, my name, as your temporary host for today, is Sam Whalen. I'm joined by my co-host, Joseph Whalen. Thank you, Sam. And if you do a good enough job, it might not be temporary. <laughs> we will see what happens. Uh, before we get to today's topic, just a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, make sure to subscribe to us on all your podcast services. Uh, that includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and anywhere else you get your podcasts uh, around the globe. Uh, most importantly, if you are watching on Twitch or watching the rebroadcast and you have Amazon Prime, uh, that means you have Twitch Prime, so you can give us the Twitch Prime subs, and they do help us out a lot. Uh, contact information, if you want to email us, you can email us at com comments, excuse me, at in my, in <laughs> I'll just try that again, comments at insightsintothings.com. Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. Uh, we can find the video uh, on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. Like I said, we are streaming six days a week on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash insights into things. Audio is going to be on podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com, uh, Facebook, insights into things podcast. Uh, and finally, links to all these, if you missed any of them, uh, are on www.insightsintothings.com. Dot com. Thank you so much for watching. Let me let me correct one one thing there. It's actually the audio's uh, podcast that insights into tomorrow. Oh, okay. Insights in entertainment is our other show. Oh, oops. Well, support all the shows. <laughs> support all the shows. Uh, but for this one, insights into tomorrow. There we go. Uh, that's a that's a mistake on my notes there. Uh, so getting into today's topic, we are talking about voter suppression. Uh, it is a big topic in the news, so we thought it would be pertinent to cover it. Uh, so going over to my co-host, what do you think when you think of voter suppression, what comes to mind for you? Well, I mean, if I, if I just rip it right out of the headlines at this point in time, it seems to be today interference with the U S postal service since we're going to be depending on mail-in voting during the pandemic. Um, but it, it's a much, sadly, much richer, deeper history than just what we're seeing today. Uh, even going back to, the technology related stuff from the 2016 election with the emails and the hacking and everything else. Um, so it's much more complicated than what we're seeing today. And what we're seeing today is some pretty sophisticated voter suppression technique. Yep. Uh, like you mentioned, you mentioned what we're going through today, what's going on in the past. And that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to break things down from the past, uh, the present, and then go ahead and look at the future. Um, so getting, uh, starting off, according to Wikipedia, which I know professors out there are going to get me for sorting that or uh, uh, citing that, but I think it's a pretty good definition. It says voter suppression in the United States concerns allegations about various efforts, uh, legal and illegal, used to prevent el eligible voters from exercising their right to vote. Uh, so these things can vary uh, depending on the place, the state, or the method. Um, a lot of the voter suppression is tied directly to voting rights, which started at the beginning of democracy itself. Um, initially, um, we'll, we'll actually touch on that later. I got mixed up there, so that's just a tease for the past. Uh, the current state of voter suppression, uh, we'll look at what President Trump is doing, uh, how he's dealing with the Postal Service, like you mentioned, and uh, how he's using tactics of fear during this pandemic to sort of encourage people how to use their votes and, and what might happen and how he's using that to his advantage. Uh, and finally, we'll look at the future of things, uh, the 2020 election, uh, what that effect might have on voter apathy, which has been a problem for many years, and how voting laws might be able to change or how we can hope they can change uh, to 
allow more people to be able to vote. And so we'll get with the past uh, in just a minute when we come right back. So like I mentioned in the when I accidentally started to go into the history of things, uh, the history of voting rights goes all the way back to the beginning of American democracy. Uh, According to the people over at uh, HowStuffWorks.com, quote, the U.S. Constitution does not explicitly include a right to vote, which is true. Uh, Only the House of Representatives were to be elected by the people, according to the Constitution. So that was where uh, the we, the people, could express their right to vote. However, these people were not all people, as you may be imagining. Uh, At first, only white male property owners were able to vote. Um, And that included some free black men later on when slavery was abolished. But even still, which we'll get into later, uh, there were restrictions in place to discourage uh, free black men from voting. Uh, Quote, all women, non-African American minorities, and many non-Christian religious groups were denied the franchise. So as you can see here, right from the beginning of the history of voting in America, immediately people were excluded and their vote, their votes were suppressed. Uh, What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that's kind of a unfortunate statement that we we legislated voter suppression from the day that this company was started. Um, so there's always been this underlying idea that only certain people should have a say in who is elected and how our government is formed. Now, that's changed significantly over years, but what we've seen is a evolution of of the legal disenfranchisement of people. Um, And I don't know, maybe I'm idealistic by thinking that over 200 years later, we might finally have it right, but it seems like we still aren't doing what we need to do in order to get people the ability to vote. Yeah, so following the Civil War, there was the era of uh, Reconstruction, which was basically the country trying to put itself back together. Uh, You had a lot more... Uh, free blacks in the South gaining sources of power uh, for a little while until a lot of that was done away with uh, with the Dixiecrats in 1877 uh, when the imposing of Jim Crow laws, which were designed to specifically restrict the black vote uh, in the South and in other places. Uh, In addition to that, the 15th Amendment allowed voting regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Um, Ideally, (laughs) unfortunately, as we see with these Jim Crow laws, things like literacy tests, Uh, Poll taxes and straight violence or intimidation were employed uh, to discourage African-Americans to vote. Um, And those literacy tests, a lot of free blacks did not know how to read because they were never taught. And poll taxes, a lot of them were economically disenfranchised as well. So that also excluded them from the right to vote. Uh, According to, again, the people at How Things Work, quote, only 3% of voting age African-American Southerners were registered to vote in 1940. So this is well after, almost 100 years after the Civil War ended. Excuse me. And still only 3% of voting age African American Southerners were registered to vote. Now in 1965, uh, jumping ahead in the timeline, we had the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which did do away with a lot of the Jim Crow laws and allowed women and minority votes to open up, uh, which did help to make voting more equal and allow more of the people to expand and to expand that definition. However, this story doesn't end there. Um, As anyone that studied history knows, racism and oppression did not just simply disappear with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, New voter suppression methods are still in use today. Uh, Common modern voter suppression techniques, there are uh, voter registration problems. So if you can't register to vote, you can't vote at all. Uh, So not all states require registration. Uh, There's also confusion on where and when to register and confusion over what you need to register. So different um, documents and qualifications can change state to state, which if people don't have access to something like a birth certificate or a passport, um, either by financial reasons or just a lack of it, then that's going to stop them from being able to vote. Uh, Voter purges. These laws vary state by state. States can purge voters from registration if they haven't voted in as few as two years. Uh, Purge is done selectively to disenfranchise minority groups. Um, So we'll touch more on later voter apathy, and this plays directly into that. Basically, if you haven't voted in two years, they can nullify your vote, which presidential elections are every four years. And there's a case to be made there that that two-year limit might be intentional because 
the biggest, I'd say the biggest election is the presidential election. That's what most people vote in, ideally. So by doing it every two years, you're going to be able to wipe out a lot of voters that would then re-register, which we just touched on could be difficult for different people. What are your thoughts on just these early, more subtle ways of getting people to taking away the ability to vote? Well, and I think a lot of it is the convenience factor, you know, what we're talking about here. The, the need, there's a certain requirement that you have to have because everyone's always very worried about voter fraud. That's what was getting thrown out now. So you, you come up with laws that on the face of them are intended to combat voter fraud, but really the underlying purpose is to make it inconvenient and difficult for people to register or to get to the polls and vote. And the one thing that your typical politicians don't want is an educated energetic and enthusiastic voting population the fewer votes they have to worry about is the less effort they have to make in order to influence those votes so by cutting back that number and and all of these laws really are designed to do that as a cut back that number of voters it makes it easier for them if they can control certain certain segments of the population like if they can get 50% 50% of the population in Louisiana to not vote, well, then they don't need to spend money campaigning down there. All they have to do is get them to not vote. Because if they're not voting for me, then they're not voting for my opponent either. Then, as just as an economic equation, they can go spend that money someplace else. And as a result, the, the citizens of the country lose out as a result. Yep, absolutely. Um, and as we often end up to the conclusion on the show, always follow the money. Uh, that's typically where you'll go. So yeah, def- definitely moving those funds around can help uh, help their campaigns. Uh, going back to the uh, more of the modern ways of voter suppression, uh, strict voter ID and ballot requirements. So these laws, again, vary state by state. Uh, some states require government-issued IDs to vote. And this was a big thing in the news a while back, uh, voter ID laws. And it's still a very important issue, especially with the upcoming election. But basically, these impede low-income, disabled, and immigrant residents who may not be able to get a government-issued ID, whether it be because of a physical disability, uh, a lack of money, or um, immigration status in general. Uh, In addition to that, voter confusion, uh, misinformation from political parties to confuse voters, messaging from official and unofficial polling can be confusing and inconsistent, incorrect ballots invalidate voters' choices. Uh, We had a little bit of that with Bush and uh, Gore in the 2000 election, I think um, somewhere around there. Sure. Earlier than that maybe, but yeah, the hanging Chad with the miscounted ballots. Yep. So even the, even if you get your vote in, it might just be counted wrong, you know, and we don't really have that as much of an issue today. Cause that incident did make uh, different methods of voting that were more secure, uh, more popular. Uh, there is still instances of voter intimidation and harassment. Racially motivated scare tactics are employed to prevent citizens from voting, uh, fake robocalls from hate groups pretending to be candidates, and inappropriate questioning at polling locations to intimidate voters. I mean, you've had, there's incidents of this up into the 2012 election with Barack Obama, groups going around trying to intimidate people of color from voting uh, to help sway the vote uh, in the other side. Poll closures and long lines. Uh, This one pretty much speaks for itself. If the polls are closed, then nobody can go there to vote. And again, it goes back to what you said about inconvenience, right? I mean, if... If you have to walk, if you've got no way to transport yourself and you have to walk five miles to the polling station and you get there and it's closed, you're not going to walk 25 miles to the next one. And and that's kind of a common theme here. You'll see a lot of these, a lot of these laws and tactics are specifically targeting people less fortunate in life, whether that be minorities or people uh, financially less well off. Uh, malfunctioning voting equipment. So sometimes things will be tampered with, uh, whether that be the voting machines or or the uh, external attacks of computerized voting, now that most things are electronic, uh, those can be targeted as well. Um, So disenfranchisement of justice-involved individuals. Uh, So felons, uh, approximately 6 million Americans, are barred from voting due to felony convictions that disenfranchise them. Uh, So if you're convicted of a felony, any felony, you cannot vote in this country. And that excludes 6 million Americans from being able to vote. And... (sighs) Again, the laws vary state uh, state by state, and I'm sure that we could probably make a whole show about the ethics of whether felons should be able to vote. I personally think they should, um, because even if you are a terrible felon of some 
some degree. I don't think it should be a clear cut line of no, no matter what you did, as long as you're marked felon, you cannot vote. I think it's not as black and white as that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I have kind of a fundamental view on this in that in order to have a civilized society in which citizens vote for the type of government that they want, there are laws and you have to abide by those laws. And once you choose to no longer abide by those laws, you have to sacrifice a certain amount of protection that you would get under a society like that. And one of those protections, I, I think, really should be your voting. You know, if you are a convicted felon, you've chosen to not abide by society's laws. So you shouldn't be able to take part in shaping those laws at that point. Now, that's not to say that if you're a convicted felon, do your time, come out and you're reformed, you shouldn't be able to vote. I think you should. But I don't think we should be rolling voting machines into a prison where people have chosen to not abide by their civic duty by by being law-abiding citizens um, because they're not the kind of people that I want voting people into office because they're going to vote people into the office that are going to be most advantageous to them, which by definition is least advantageous to a civilized society. But that's just my personal opinion. No, that's understandable. I mean, if like you said, if if they're the felons that are still serving their time and have committed horrible crimes, and no, they should they shouldn't be able to vote. But then it's when you run into the people that have served their time but are still marked as felon that those people are also being excluded. It it makes you wonder where that. No, line and is I drawn. I agree with you hundred yeah. percent. Like the the purpose of our penal system is to punish but reform. And if you're reformed to the point that we can put you back into everyday society, then you should be reformed to the point that you should be able to vote and be a participating member of society again. It's, it's yeah. just it's a fundamental yeah, right. Absolutely. Uh, so we do have one more tactic here. We've got gerrymandering, which is politicians manipulate voting redistricting in ridiculous ways to shape the voting pools. Uh, this is a pretty blatant attempt to manipulate the voting population and has direct and lasting impact on election results. So you can look up pictures of this where districts are, I mean, they're literally maps of locations. And they're drawn in such a way that a certain um, politician will be able to get more votes because of the way the district is drawn. And it's changing and moving these lines around, which is done constantly, that allows for votes to be moved around and, and pulled in certain areas. And it's it's like this, like we have here, a blatant attempt to manipulate the, manipulate the voting population and an all too popular one. Um, so we're going to take a quick break and then we'll get into the current conditions and the source and symptoms of how uh, voter uh, suppression is used today. Before we jump out, though, I did want to mention, you know, a different view on gerrymandering while it's definitely something that's used to manipulate uh, voter bases. I think it really epitomizes what most of our problems are with voter suppression right now. And that is one, it, your ability to elect people in the office, the, the legal rights of that vary so much from state to state, especially when you're, electing someone of a federal office, a senator, a congressman, or a president. The laws in your local area can vary significantly from across the country, which is one of the problems. There's no consistency in the law. The other is that gerrymandering highlights probably the biggest problem we have, and that is the people that are making the laws for how we vote and how we elect politicians are the very politicians that are affected by them. So as a result, you have to assume, quite rightly, that that the lawmaking, when it comes to this type of event, is going to be advantageous first and foremost to the politicians and not the citizens. So to me, that's why it, it was perfect having gerrymandering last, because it really rolls up all the problems that we have and symbolizes it in one single thing there, even though that itself is its own problem. Yeah, definitely. And it really, I mean, obviously we're pretty cynical on this show, but all these these tactics made by the people in power specifically designed to keep them in power and to prevent voting is so contrary to what you'd think the typical American view of democracy is where everybody gets a say 
everybody gets an equal say and your vote matters. And clearly, as we're seeing here, your vote is manipulated and controlled in a variety of ways, not the least of which is moving maps and changing maps to get more power to either prevent or to corral your vote. And it's it's anti-American in a way, really. Everyone is equal, but there are those who are more equal than others. Exactly. And uh, as we'll see coming up, there are we have some specific examples of some of the methods we just mentioned uh, that we will highlight that are more concrete examples of voter suppression. All right. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back, everybody. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about voter suppression today. Uh, we just got through the history and some of the more uh, modern techniques used to do it. And we're going to get into some more um, real world examples of how it worked. So in one of the most important topics or uh, tactics rather used for voter suppression is the use of disinformation. And that is a very broad umbrella thing that is used to manipulate everybody in a variety of ways nowadays. Um, but with voter suppression, it comes down to the highly popular and effective modern methods used. Uh, so in 2008, the 2008 elections, Democrats in Nevada received robocalls informing them that they could vote on November 5th. This was a day after the election uh, to avoid the long lines. So basically, all these people in Nevada got fake calls telling them a fake date for the real election. And this did impact the amount of votes that came in Nevada because a bunch of people showed up the next day to vote for an election that was already over and already won. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this example? Have you experienced any kind of robocalls for voting? Uh, I have not. Somehow I've managed to get off of all the calling lists for robocalls. And I think it's probably because a couple that I've, I had in the past uh, did not end well for the caller. Uh, I, I don't take political ads very well when people bother me with them. Although I'm getting hammered with spam, I will I will say that because it's so much easier to get through to people. Um, but this is exactly the tactics that, that I was re referring to earlier, where if they can get those numbers down, then it's so much easier for them to control the people that they know they can get their votes from. And a lot of times, the people that they target are the lower income, lesser privileged individuals because those are an unknown quantity to politicians. Politicians like guarantees. And the people that are willing to commit to funding their campaign and contributing to their campaign or showing up to their rallies, they're the ones that they know they don't have to convince them. But the people that are lower income, people can't afford to contribute to campaigns, so they don't have a list of you know, these people as known good people. Yeah. So let's just make sure they don't vote at all. We'll grab the smaller group that we know we have and we'll run with that. So this is, this is a very typical technique I'd expect to see. Yeah. And again, like you just mentioned, we're seeing more of that targeting of people that are less financially well off or, or minority groups. And, and that's, it goes hand in hand with the, with the voter suppression we're seeing today. Uh, speaking of today, um, Excuse me, it's difficult to talk about this without mentioning President Trump. And if you've been reading the news or staying current with the news, uh, most recently, uh, President Trump went on Fox Business Network and uh, explicitly noted two funding provisions that Democrats are seeking in a relief package that has stalled on Capitol Hill. Uh, 
Trump said without the additional money, the Postal Service won't have the resources to handle a flood of ballots from voters who are seeking uh, to avoid polling places during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this is courtesy of ABC7.com. Uh, so this is the big reason we wanted to talk about this topic today. Uh, President Trump has been very vocal about his distrust in mail-in ballots and his efforts to dismantle the Postal Service and discredit them um, have been... Um, enormous, uh, to say the least. Um, so now in this most recent interview, Trump, his quote is, if we don't make a deal, that means they don't get the money. He told host Maria, uh, bar to your tomorrow. Sorry if I mispronounced that name. Uh, he goes on to say, quote, that means they can't have universal mail-in voting. They just can't have it. End quote. So Trump is essentially admitting there that he is intentionally withholding funds from the postal service to prevent the, ability for people to mail in their votes, um, which is going to be a uh, critical way of collecting votes during the coronavirus pandemic uh, coming up in the November election. Uh, what are your thoughts on his his comments here? Well, I th I actually, and, and you mentioned earlier that we're cynical here, and, and <laughs> we, we probably are, uh, but I think, I think the actions of our politicians warranted at this point. I can't help but think that this goes much deeper than just the U.S. Postal Service because these threats against the U.S. Postal Service wouldn't work if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic where people were afraid to go to public polling places. So if you step back and take a look at it from a 30,000-foot standpoint, you have to wonder, was the whole COVID-19 pandemic manufactured to set up this ability to suppress voters now because the voting suppression technique, because the first thing he did, remember the first thing he did was come out and tell us over and over without a single piece of evidence that mail-in voting was ripe for fraud. Um, there's no evidence because it's never been done before. What we do have evidence of is absentee ballots and the fraud percentage of absentee ballots is minuscule. Um, yeah, I actually have a number here. Uh, just really quick. In the past 20 years, uh, 0.00006% of all mail-in ballots cast were fraudulent. Quote, there is no support uh, for the argument that mail-in voting is a problem. This comes from Lorraine uh, Midnight, a political science professor at Rutgers University. So there's your statistic right there. Right. It's a negligible number in the past 20 years of mail-in uh, ballots that were fraudulent. Right. So his first claim that it's fraud didn't didn't pan out. Right. Um, you know, you tell a lie big enough and often enough, people start to believe it. Well, no one believed this one because there was so much supporting evidence to shoot it down. So now he knows that he can't set this up as a legal challenge to say, oh, it's fraud. So instead, he, he switches to his next tactic of, well, let's just make sure people can't do it. I can't legally do it. He can't legally stop people from doing the mail-in voting, especially when you have governors who are already sending the ballots out. So... He declares a state of emergency so that he can defund the post office. Now, just to put things into perspective right now, he declares a state of emergency so he can sign a executive order that allows him to basically shut the postal service down to a certain extent to impede people's ability to mail in ballot. We have over 165,000 people dead in this country now as a result of the COVID-19 virus. And we still haven't gotten a state of emergency declared on that. So it's, to me, it's, it's painfully obvious that our current administration is employing tactics that we would expect to see from third world petty dictators to try to hold on to power. Um, and, Right now, to a large extent, his opponents, the Democrats, are powerless to stop him because they only control part of the, the Senate and Congress. I think it's important to note that should Donald Trump get reelected, even to another four years, after those four years or even after this election, Donald Trump is, is out of the – political spotlight. He has no political ties. He has no political backers. He has no political control. He has only what he has right now. 
So as a result, all of these Republicans that are hitching their wagons to Donald Trump and defending him and supporting him through all these clearly illegal actions are going to be left high and dry. Whether it's after this election or the next, they still need to get reelected. And when you choose the wrong side of history and you do it in such a spectacularly public way, it's going to come back. There, there's going to be a toll that has to be paid for that. And that's going to be in the number of seats that the Republicans will see in the Senate moving forward when Donald Trump isn't around anymore. Now, I don't want to turn into a political consultant here or anything like that. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we have a, a president here who really is employing tactics that are, they've gone beyond questionable. I mean, they were questionable three years ago, four years ago. Now they're downright illegal. And you have Congress feels like it's powerless to do anything about it. And if Congress feels that way, how do you think the average voting American feels? And that in and of itself is a form of voter suppression. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's definitely, I think that's one of the biggest things we're dealing with today. Um, and voter apathy comes right with that. We see a president doing whatever he wants with basically no re repercussions or, or limits, um, blatantly making moves to ensure his power for whoever knows how long, suppressing votes, and then telling reporters, yeah, I'm doing this on purpose and it's working. And it's, and Voter apathy was already a big issue in this country. I don't have the exact numbers, but I know that in the past couple presidential elections, voter numbers have been going down because people feel like their votes don't matter. And especially in 2016 with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, when it was Trump got the Electoral College to declare him the winner. And I think that that was a really harsh blow to the voting uh, fervor in America because people... Hillary Clinton got the popular vote and lost. Well, so, and, and that's not the first time that's yeah. happened in history. That happened in 2000 as well when when mm -hmm. uh, Bush, yep. you know, took office and uh, Al Gore had the popular vote. And it's happened in the past. Yeah. But every time it has happened, people feel disenfranchised. People start to question whether we really need the Electoral College because – yeah, we needed it 150, 200 years ago because of the limitations that we had. Do we really need it now? Um, but, you know, it's going to take an act of Congress and a, a constitutional amendment to do away with it. So that's not going to happen. But you still have people that are left wondering, why should I vote? Yep. Yeah. And that's, as you said, another form of voter suppression. Uh, so moving on, there's this documentary on, <clears throat> I believe it's on Netflix, right? Netflix, yeah. Uh, called The Great Hack, and it deals with uh, Facebook Cambridge uh, analytical data scandal. It's a it's a good watch. If it's a little leaning to one side, but I think it's still very informative. Um, it came out end of last year, I think, like I November, think so, October. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, it uh, details how the Trump campaign engaged with Cambridge Analytica, which is a a tech tech uh, company, a data analyst company. Uh, to micro-target and influence the 2016 election. Uh, Cambridge Analytica was employed to influence elections in over 30 countries prior to the 2016 election. Uh, these countries include the United States, the United Kingdom, Argentina, Colombia, uh, Guyana? Guyana. Guyana, sorry about that, and Uruguay. You, right? Uruguay? Sure, close enough. I was never very good at geography. Sorry <laughs> to the, those people if you are listening from uh, those countries. Um so if you do watch this documentary, it pretty blatantly shows – it details what Cambridge Analytica does and how they composite user profiles based on data that people use in any aspect of life, mostly on social media or what they buy online shopping. And they compile all this data and they make it so that people can be targeted more effectively to vote uh, on either side of a political party. So if you like a lot of posts – uh, that are left-leaning, then Cambridge takes that data and targets you with more left-leaning ads to further you down that line of thinking. And the same thing with the right. So I think using all that data to further influence people on a larger level is extremely dangerous and in itself is a, a form of suppression because you're being 
um, closed-minded. You're being sealed off from other ways of thinking because you're just being further down this rabbit hole to think a certain way. And I think with the rise of how important social media is, especially with um, President Trump having such an active Twitter account and such a wide social media following, I think these things go hand in hand. And the Cambridge Analytical um, Facebook scandal is a clear example of that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, and I, th I give Cambridge Analytica total props because what they did really was brilliant. Um, they managed to convince Facebook uh, to give them access to all this user information. And it wasn't just a matter of convincing, figuring out how to convince someone to vote for a candidate that they wouldn't usually do, which is difficult in and of itself. But they have a storied history in appealing to certain populations with this micro-targeting that they do. And there was one campaign, I believe it was Bolivia, I don't remember entirely, but I think it was Bolivia, it was a Central American, South American country. And the opponent employed Cambridge Analytica to come in to reduce the number of votes for their opponent. They weren't even trying to win votes because they, they knew that they had a guaranteed percentage of the population. And they knew all they had to do was to convince a certain portion of the population to not vote. Just don't show up. So Cambridge Analytica used this data from Facebook to bombard uh, a certain young population, young voting population in this country to basically think, oh, well, it's the cool thing not to vote. Only the old people vote. Only the, only the privileged vote. We're not going to vote. And it convinced enough people to just not show up and vote. Whether they were going to vote for one candidate or the other, the risk that they could have voted for their opponent was all that they needed to stop them from voting. And when this percentage of the population didn't vote, they didn't feel like they were being suppressed. They didn't feel like they were being taken advantage of. They thought they were doing what the cool thing was to do. And that's the psychological advantage that companies like Cambridge Analytica have when they have this data. Um, we make references to comic book references in scenarios a lot of times. And this makes me think of, um, of what was it, Captain America? Oh, Winter Soldier? Winter Soldier. Yeah, where they have the shield helicarriers that have all the data and they look at potential targets. Right. It's like Minority you, Report, too. Yeah. But you have Zola's algorithm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's what they had was they had this magical algorithm that churned all this data and told them who they had to go after and what they had to do. And it worked. The person, the candidate that hired Cambridge Analytica won the election. Yep. And it's, it's really something as simple as that, the psychological warfare that they employ that makes them so dangerous. Yeah, I think, and, and you can still see that today, really. I mean, if you get into any kind of social media like I said before, rabbit hole where you're exploring and I'll do that from time to time. Like I'll, I'll go, I'm definitely more left leaning. So I'll try to go to more uh, right leaning Twitter accounts and I follow and I go further and further and I get, I try to see their point of view and I try to look at those ideas and you see this kind of manipulation there, whether it be from what I think are real people or just Twitter bots. And, and Twitter is very uh, particularly bad with it where there's just bots that just tweet things that are, you know, taking this data and just spitting out words. But this kind of this informational suppression and, and closing off is still apparent today and it's still unfortunately effective. And I think we're going to see it. We are seeing it again with the 2020 election. Yeah. So going back to some of the things we mentioned earlier in terms of modern voter suppression, uh, we touched on it a little bit. But the voter ID um, um, legislation, excuse me, is, is still very important. This is courtesy of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, according to them, millions of Americans lack ID. 11% of U.S. citizens, or more than 21 million Americans, do not have government-issued photo identification. So right out of the gate, you have 11% of the population, 21 million people, that do not have government-issued photo IDs for whatever reason. And when it comes to voter ID laws, from the get-go, if you don't have a government-issued ID, you can't vote. So that's 21 million people that are simply excluded for one reason or another for not having an ID. Obtaining ID costs money. Even if ID is offered for free, voters must incur numerous costs, such as paying for birth certificates to apply for a government-issued ID. 
And these costs, while they may seem small to some people, for someone living paycheck to paycheck or that has to support a family, these costs can add up. And when you speak about that voter apathy, those things can sometimes go hand in hand. Well, I need to get a government ID. Well, that's going to cost me one hundred fifty dollars. That's that's food for my kids for a week. You know. Yeah. So that's that's some that's stopping some people right there. Underlying documents required to obtain ID cost money, like I just said, a significant expense for lower income Americans. The combined cost of document fees, travel expenses, and waiting time can be anywhere from seventy five to one hundred and seventy five dollars. So that is that can be a significant sum of money to a lot of people. Uh, the travel required is also a major burden. Uh, this can be with people with disabilities, the elderly, or those in rural areas that don't have access to public transportation. Uh, specifically in Texas, some people in rural areas must travel approximately 170 miles to reach the nearest ID office, which if you don't have a car, that's highly unlikely you're going to travel 170 miles on foot. But that, do those numbers aren't really unusual for Texas. I mean, Texas is a geographic yeah. anomaly. You're a half hour from everything in Texas at <laughs> yeah, least. Definitely. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on these these um, these restrictions and, and how they can impact the elderly or, or people without the financial backing? They're, they're definitely legitimate concerns. My mother was one who never drove, so she never needed a government ID. Um, so when she was told she needed one to register to vote, voting wasn't important to her at that point in time. Um, the only time she wound up getting a, a, a ID was when she had to open a bank account at one of the local banks and they required her to have a voter ID or a, a photo ID. Um, and she had to jump through hoops because you don't have a lot of the same documentation you would normally need in order to um, obtain those IDs. Um, you look at in New Jersey itself, we need a, I don't know what the point system is now, but you have to generate documents that are equal to a certain number of points. Well, some of those documents are things that immigrants wouldn't have. You know, if you emigrated here from another, legally from another country, you might not have your birth certificates or your baptismal records or any of the stuff from a country you may have been fleeing from because you're trying to avoid the oppression. Um, you might not have bills in your name. If you live with family, one of the documents, one of the series of documents you could get in New Jersey were any bills that were milled, utility bills, uh, phone bills, gas bills, water bills, that type of thing. Well, if you're a recent immigrant to the country and you can't afford your own home, you may be living with someone and all the bills are in their name, so you can't use those as a, as a form of ID. So... This is one of those ones where they use the whole idea of, oh, well, let's throw out voter fraud. Okay, well, if you can't prove you are who you are, then you shouldn't be allowed to vote because it's going to cause fraud. When statistically speaking, the fraud numbers are insignificantly low. But that's the impetus for using voter ID is to, is to one, scare people from voting. Because if you don't have a voter ID and you walk into a hall – it, it terrifies people because you're going to be asked for something you don't have. And the reaction that you get, especially in today's volatile law enforcement police um, environment, that could lead to significant issues that you run into. So that scares people away in and of itself. Not even the fact that I can't even get one of these because I don't have the documentation that's needed, but because we could throw out the, the, we can link through some, theoretical justification voter fraud with voter id then we can justify segmenting that portion of the population off and denying them yeah absolutely and i think that you know you kind of made me think of something i think I've, on this show before i mentioned the concept of how there always has to be an other right there always has to be some kind of enemy or some kind of idea to rally people against whether that be for good or evil and i think that voter fraud is that other for this, because as you said, the numbers on actual voter fraud are insignificant almost. But the concept of voter fraud, that the worst thing you can do as an American is vote 
and lie about it or not vote at all and pretend you're somebody else. When in reality, by using the concept of voter fraud to deter people from voting is the really anti-democracy thing. And it's it's these levels of mental chess, of manipulation of an entire population of people and getting it in their head that either your vote doesn't matter or the biggest threat to your democracy is this other. And and it's it's dangerous, really. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's hard to dig through the the vines of, of all these manipulations. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back and look at the future of voter suppression. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back, everybody. We are going to get into the future and potential solutions for how to combat uh, voter suppression. Uh, so this article comes from Rolling Stone, and it's just some of the comments that President Trump has made, again, regarding um, voter suppression and his thoughts on uh, his lawsuits at the time. So in the 2020 election, which is the big thing we have coming up, uh, the RNC has filed over $20 million worth of lawsuits dealing with voting. Uh, this is a quote from Rolling Stone. Some attempt to block litigation brought by Democratic groups to expand mail-in voting in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Others seek to invalidate state-level policies by saying that expanding access to mail-in ballots invites fraud. So this is kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, how there's the this wide effort to discredit mail-in voting. And right here you have the, the number of $20 million worth of lawsuits dealing with voting. And again, it's, it's the blatant uh, evidence of what President Trump and the administration and the Republican Party in general are doing to discredit um, mail-in voting. So what are your thoughts on the $20 million uh, worth of lawsuits against this? Uh, I can't help but think how many mailboxes that would pay for to keep on the street, <laughs> yeah. $20 million. Yep. Um, but you're right. I mean, we have blatant – not only do we have blatant attempts to impede voters from voting, this is the first administration who's ever come out publicly on national television and invited foreign powers to interfere in an American election. How that itself is not treasonous and treated as such, it blows my mind. But when when that was not effective enough for him to maintain the numbers that he thought he needed in the polls, which he's still 12 points down, by the way, in the recent, recent uh, Reuters poll, um, he stepped up the game. So now we're literally pulling mailboxes off the street three months in advance of the election. We have sorting machines that are being broken down. We have instructions being given to the postmaster general that would deliberately make it difficult to count and handle the volume required for mail-in voting. How this is not a criminal offense is, is beyond me. It really is. Um, and I hope and I pray, and I'm not a very religious individual, but I pray that should... The Democrats come out on top in this election that we don't do something really bad like grant immunity or a pardon mm -hmm. to Trump for what he's doing to this country because this is destroying the country more than anything any outside force has ever done. We, you know, we've, I've lived through, you've lived through 9 11. You know, we lived through riots. We've lived through. You know, the country has lived through a civil war. And I think what's happening today with how we're treating our 
democracy and our government is far more dangerous than even the Civil War was. And it's frightening. It really is. Yeah. It makes me feel very apprehensive for tomorrow's, for you and, and tomorrow's generation and the rest of the, of the younger generation in this country right now. It's terrifying. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a scary, it's a scary prospect and, and hopefully, and maybe everything we've covered today might say to the contrary, but hopefully our vote will still matter and our voices will still matter and that won't go away. And we'll, we'll probably touch more on that when we get to our, our closing statements in just a little bit. But going back to this uh, Rolling Stone article, uh, Rick Hasen, a University of California Irvine law professor and author of Election Meltdown, says the goal of these lawsuits is to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election, raising spurious fraud claims. So just like we just talked about, the goal is to discredit and disenfranchise and, and dis spread disinformation. And speaking of that disinformation, uh, a big... A uh, common theme has been the use of COVID-19 to stir up fear of the election being in danger, when in reality, these precautions are being taken to uh, save lives, not to harm them. So things like social distancing, the use of mail-in voting, um, and we've touched on this mostly for the most part already. But basically, there's things being done for COVID-19 are being spun by members of the Trump administration as harming democracy, when in reality, it is, uh, you know, the administration that is the one that is the one doing that. Um, specifically, uh, the group has run ads that warn against risky new methods like mail-in ballots and accuse Wisconsin Democrats of sowing election quote chaos after the state's Republicans refused to send every voter an absentee ballot or delay its primary election because of COVID-19. Again, this is from that Rolling Stone article. So in Wisconsin, you're seeing direct targeting of these of the Wisconsin Democrats because of how they had to handle things because of COVID-19. And in reality, it's not about, it seemed like it was meant to, to save lives, to prevent the disease from spreading, but it was taken and spun for political gain, which is horrible. And, and unfortunately it, it might've worked for some people. Well, and I think a lot of what we're seeing out of the current administration is for political gain. Um, the Trump administration still doesn't want to admit we have an issue. You know, every time uh, Donald Trump addresses any media organization regarding COVID-19, we're told, oh, it's getting better. We're doing great. We're doing fine. The numbers are coming down. And being cynical again, I've come to expect lies from all politicians um, more so from Donald Trump. Uh, I think he's statistically told more lies and misinformation in office than any other president in the time he's been in office, which is provable. But this one, this series of lies are so blatant and so easily proven wrong that it's almost like he's daring people to challenge him on this. His own administration is having difficulty combating some of the misinformation that he's putting out. It changes. The, the, the administration policy statements change multiple times over a 24-hour period because the administration officials come up with a policy. They put Trump in front of the camera, and Trump, it's like short attention span theater. He can't stay on point for more than five seconds before he goes off on one of his tirades and one of his rants. And it's counter to what the administration is. So, and he's popular. He, 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 he very frequently throws out the term of fake news. And it's ironic that he's generating more fake news about everything than is being generated about him. Um, so the messaging itself, the, the obvious attempts at disinformation, um, the fact that if something controversial comes up, he's very quick to generate another manufactured controversy over here. You know, everyone pay attention to the new controversy over here and we'll all ignore what was going on. He's a master manipulator when it comes to that. Like it's, it's almost, it's almost like sleight of hand in a magician. You know, and he's he's 
constantly misdirecting people. And the press and America, and I'm sad to say this, are so stupid that they continuously fall for it. And that's why we're in the position that we're in now. Um, because we're all falling for this misinformation. And, and until people have the wherewithal to step back and to objectively look at the statements and the claims and do their own research, we're, we're sheep. And, and that's where one of the biggest problems is today. Yeah, definitely. And as we, we kind of come to the end of the show for today, uh, just to wrap things up, just like you said, it's about misinformation and, and misdirection, just like it has been pretty much any other time we've talked about this administration, regardless of what they're handling. Um, but just a couple things. There is the upcoming 2020 election, so make sure to inform yourself as best you can. And part of informing yourself means looking at what other people that don't think like you think. And it's important to do that and to expose yourself to other ideas. Uh, I know just in today, we've only scraped the surface, especially when it comes to the Postal Service, um, s not scandal, but the Postal Service situation. So that's definitely worth looking into because it's been going on for longer than just the media has been covering it now. Um, and it's bigger than just Trump on Twitter. These things are systematic and designed to control and to manipulate. I mean, we covered the past going all the way back to the founding of the country and how these things were were designed from the get-go to corral people's votes. Um, and most importantly, you know, make sure you do your own research and make your conclusions and, and keep your mind open but suspicious. What are your closing, closing thoughts? Well, I agree with you 100%. I think the one thing that terrifies politicians the most is an educated voter base. So the more educated you get, the better off we are as a country. Um, it's good to have politicians scared of the voters because when they lose that fear of being able to get reelected, because you remember, that's all politicians want. Most politicians start out with all of the zeal and vigor and, and noble causes that but most American citizens tend to feel. And they think that getting into politics is what's going to get them to that. And there have been people like Jesse Ventura, who was the former governor of Minnesota. He thought, well, you know what? If I run for office, I can change it. I can make a difference. And what he realized is that when he got into office, the system is not designed to be changed, certainly not for the disadvantage of the politicians. And he spent two terms as governor and hated it. He got blocked at every possible corner. And he was just beaten down and frustrated when he left office. And, and the, that's not the typical reaction. The typical reaction is a politician goes in there, they learn how to play the game, and then they slowly get corrupted over time. And then they lose that fear of the voter. Because at that point, the only thing that they want is to get reelected. And as long as they get reelected, they'll say and do anything. They don't care about you, the voter. They don't care about the district, the constituents, the county, the state, the country. They don't care. All they care about is getting reelected. And when the, there's a danger of that because you as a voter are educated and you know what their position is and what their voting history is and what their philosophy is, then there's a chance that you're not going to vote for that. And that's what scares them. So let's scare the politicians. And I'm not just talking Trump. I'm talking every politician out there. Let's scare the hell out of them and educate ourselves and learn what the topics are and what the controversies are and what their positions are and then make an educated decision when we go to the polls. Absolutely. And I think that and that that's not easy. That's not an easy thing to do, but it's important. And as Americans and as humans. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do. It's not going to be easy and it's going to be difficult, but it's something that we all have to do, especially with this upcoming election. I agree a hundred percent. All right. Uh, anything else? I think that's it. All right, well, thank you for having me on today as your potentially temporary, maybe permanent host. We'll see how things go. Uh, but this has been insights into tomorrow. Thank you everybody so much for tuning in and have a fantastic day. Stay safe.